In this video, we'll look at three factors that actually make a difference and actually move the needle when you're trying to build an audience online. In the last video, we looked at some of the factors that are the wrong things to focus on, the things that are keeping entrepreneurs stuck when they're trying to generate more traffic and build an audience for their business. We've seen that there are a lot of superficial things that we can focus on in trying to make better content or trying to reach an audience that simply don't move the needle. In this video, the goal is to take a deeper look past those superficial factors and look at what actually matters. And the first thing I want to address here is a certain illusion that keeps a lot of people stuck. It's like we have this comforting fantasy that maybe if only we get enough followers, if only we build up a large enough group of you know, Instagram followers, social followers, YouTube subscribers, whatever, if only that number gets large enough that would basically solve all of our problems. And one of the reasons why a lot of entrepreneurs get stuck there is because we feel that we already know how to do that. We are already social media users. We are already used to, we already know how to post on social media. And we've already seen that sometimes when we post something, it gets a bigger response. We get more validation. We get more of a result from that than other times. And we also have this image of some people have these huge accounts and they get sponsorship deals and stuff. And they basically live the, this, these lavish lifestyles thanks to their massive accounts. And we kind of put two and two together and we ask ourselves, well, what if I just do more of this stuff on social media that gets lots of likes, that gets more of a response? Won't I eventually also get to that point where I have loads of followers? And again, the idea is it kind of solves all of our problems. And that sounds easier than the, the complicated work of actually building an online business. That sounds kind of difficult and intimidating and means that we have to do things that we're not familiar with yet. And so this familiarity with social media and the fantasy of all the problems being solved by a large enough follower count is what makes a lot of entrepreneurs not even attempt to do any real business building work. Of course, in reality, it is always more complicated than that. And by just trying to stick to what we know, we're really avoiding a deeper confrontation with what's actually going on. So right here, let's have that deeper confrontation. And here are two things to keep in mind right away. Number one, we have to start thinking about traffic and about our audience as people. These are made up of individual people and we can't think of it in the abstract. It's not like we simply can you know, open up the tap of followers or traffic and in some abstract sense, oh, we just have millions and somehow that translates into money. No, there is something happening there that involves individual people who individually make a decision to either engage with your content or not, to either visit your website or not, to either buy something from you or not. And if you don't understand that process, then you'll never be able to make deliberate strategic choices about how to grow your business. And number two, what we're going to do here in order to move away from the superficiality of the kind of vanity metrics we talked about in the last video, we're going to approach this not from a technical viewpoint, but from a viewpoint of human psychology. Because again, we're talking about actual people who are in real time making decisions about whether they want to pay attention to you and your business and your brand, whether they want to buy from you and so on. So we have to understand the psychology of the individual human that is engaging with us online. So with that said, let's look at a model that has three parts that will show you what actually moves the needle. And those three parts are reach, shareability, and retention. Let's start with part number one, reach. So what is it that gives anything online reach or exposure? What's the difference between a blog post or a video or a social post that gets basically no engagement at all and one that gets thousands or hundreds of thousands or even more views? What is actually happening there on a deeper level? So the first thing here is that we have to place a message in the right place. So think about the difference between someone standing in a broom closet and telling a story where obviously no one will ever hear it versus standing in a busy crowd or on stage in front of an audience and telling the same story. So that's the first factor. Where is our message being placed and are there people there? And then the second factor is what do we talk about? And is the message aligned with something that the people we're talking to are interested in? And is it aligned with their interests, their worldview? Does it speak to a problem they have or anything like that? Here, the important thing to remember is that the demand comes from the users. The demand comes from the audience. So think of it like this. If I simply turn on the camera and start talking about whatever is on my mind right now, whatever is interesting or important to me right now, what happens? 
Well, first of all, whatever I produce is going to be fairly rambly and I'm going to be jumping between tangents and so on as things come up for me. And it's very unlikely that this is going to be a really valuable, really interesting piece of content. And it's very unlikely that it will exactly match someone else's interests of what is important to them right now, what's on their mind or what they want to learn right now. So if I kind of just make stream of consciousness content like that, maybe I lock out, maybe that appeals to some people, maybe that gains some reach, but it's very unlikely. And really, I'm just rolling the dice on that. So I have to have an awareness of what are people interested in? What can I do to connect what I'm saying with what's on someone's mind, what they want to learn and so on. And that's what I mean by the demand comes from the users. So what we have to do is, first of all, we have to be able to get out of our own heads and not just think of in terms of what do I think is important, what is on my mind, what do I find interesting, but think about how will this be received? What does this sound like to someone who isn't living inside of my head? So to continue with this example, instead of making a rambly stream of consciousness piece of content, I want to intersect my own interests and my own knowledge with something that there's demand for. So let's say I am interested in productivity and I realize that one of the problems that people in my space have, that entrepreneurs have, is that they struggle with productivity and procrastination. And so I narrow my focus down to that and I make a piece of content about how to deal with or defeat procrastination as a work from home entrepreneur. Now suddenly, instead of it just being well Shane talking for an hour, it is a very specific topic and that helps people find it. So the other thing here is I need to use the right terms and the right language. And this is where we get into the realm of basically algorithms. So here the question is, what terms are people using to actually find this content? So someone who is struggling with procrastination as an entrepreneur, what search terms are they typing? What other content are they consuming? And then we have things like search optimization. So using the right keywords, the right terms in, in the title and in the content. And we have also things like hashtag optimization and so on on social media, where we have to be aware of basically where are the right people and how can I create a piece of content that will get surfaced for those people. And then the next step is again, algorithmic. That is basically how reach happens. My content has to serve the people that find it. It has to you know, be entertaining and informative and useful enough for them. And it has to serve the platform that is being placed on. Whether something is surfaced in Google search results, then you know, Google wants to be the place that offers the best search results so that it can sell their ads. Or whether it is on a social platform where the social platform wants to keep people engaged on the social platform. So my content has to help the platform reach that goal. Let's say it's a YouTube video. YouTube wants people to watch more YouTube videos. So if I manage to make a video where if people watch it, they keep watching it, they watch it for a long time and they go on to engage, maybe they leave a comment and they go watch something else I posted. YouTube will see that and say, I like this. I'm going to show this to more people. And that is how reach works. There's no magic to it, right? That is the only way reach happens. I have to make a piece of content that intersects with a demand that comes from people. I have to use the right terms to help that get surfaced for those people. And I have to serve the platform that my content is being surfaced on in order for that platform to boost my content and bring it to more people. One of the reasons I'm insisting so much on deconstructing this is because something I see far too often is a lot of talk about value and quality content as if, if all you do is I'm just making good content, right? I make a good video with valuable advice. That's going to be enough to get reach, to get traffic. Well, that's just not true. Right? The, the algorithm, the platforms don't care really about the quality of your content. And, and there is no such thing as quality content. What they care about is engagement. What they care about, they have each platform has its signals by which it makes those decisions of who gets to see what. And if we're naive to that, and if we just say, oh, I'm just gonna try my best to make good content, then we're gonna forever be frustrated about the results we get. Having said that, there is one thing that is in a way non-algorithmic, and that is sharing. So if someone decides to share a piece of content with their friends, send it to someone, that is something that the algorithm essentially has no control over. And you can gain reach through word of mouth, essentially, people sharing your thing. So that is factor number two. Let's talk about shareability. Now, when it comes to what makes people share something, 
again, you'll see a lot of talk about quality content and all this kind of stuff, but it, it is not as simple as that. And you can probably tell by now that we're gonna go deeper than that. What is it that makes people share something? Well, one factor is of course, that intersection with their interest. The intersection with something they care about, something they're interested in and their worldview. And that's what we've just covered before. And here's a hint, these three factors that we're talking about are not just separate factors, but they can be built up on each other. So if you use this correctly, you can stack these three factors on top of each other to get the best possible results. So that's the first kind of stacking. We are stacking principle number one of reach, intersecting what we talk about with people's interest and demand. And on top of that, we're gonna stack shareability. So we create something that people are interested in and that helps them share it. But what are other factors? Well, the second factor is what I call sound biteness. So how easily can this be kind of summarized into a sound bite? Even if you have a really in-depth and lengthy piece of content, it's important that people can grasp what this thing is about without having to engage with all of it. So let's say I have a 3000 word post about procrastination. It's important that people don't have to read all 3000 words before they can decide whether this is something that aligns with their values, whether this is something they'd want to share or not. The perhaps unfortunate truth is that a lot of people will share content on online and even discuss content online without actually reading the content. So studies have been made. We can basically trick people in having big discussions on Facebook about an article that really is only a headline and that has no actual content. So people will see the headline and they will see the thumbnail and based on that, they will decide what their stance on this thing is. And based on that, they'll often decide whether or not to share a piece of content. So whatever your topic is and however in depth it is, make sure that you have a title and a thumbnail for that thing that summarizes it, that gives people kind of a benefit or something that arouses curiosity, but something that basically people can decide just based on that, yes, this is the kind of thing I want to share. And that brings us to the third and possibly most important factor for shareability. And that is how does it make the sharer look? So if the sharer, the person who is sharing my piece of content, what do they look like vis-a-vis -vis their friends that they're sharing this to? This could be one of the most important factors. Some sociologists posit that this kind of social signaling is one of the main drivers behind most human behavior. So when someone posts something online, they're not simply thinking about, is this interesting? Is this valuable for other people? They're also thinking about what will this make me look like? Does it make me look smart if I share this? Does it make me look sophisticated? And sometimes more importantly, does this signal my belonging to my tribe? Now, once you pay attention to this, you'll find this everywhere. Oftentimes people are sharing things online or making statements and posts online simply as a way to signal their belonging to their tribe. So whatever that tribe is, right? So maybe on the political left or on the political right, or maybe veganism or the keto diet or functional fitness or whatever it is, right? You have like your little tribe and you post things. And these are often very shallow things like, you know, memes or jokes or whatever, that really all they do is they signal, I belong to this tribe. So this is something we should always consider, especially if we create a piece of content, for example, a blog post, where we can have a social title, a social meta description and the social thumbnail that are separate from the title on our blog post itself. And we can really cater that. We can think of the social title and thumbnail as like the advertising for our piece of content. So if you think of the example of, let's say someone shares an article about something scientific, there are gonna be all three factors involved. Number one, okay, someone's interested in sciencey stuff, maybe they have sciencey friends, and so they want to share that article. But number two, it's gonna be more shareable if the headline is not cryptic, if it doesn't take a great cognitive load or a lot of time to kind of disentangle what is this about, right? If it's very clear from a catchy headline what this is about, then that's gonna make it more shareable. And number three, Someone sharing that science article probably wants to be seen as someone who's fairly sophisticated, wants to be seen as someone who reads this kind of content. And again, depending on how that is framed, if it makes them look good, if it makes them look smart, that will make content far more shareable. Factor number three is retention. Now retention is a fairly tricky factor because we can create content 
that gets a lot of reach and that is very shareable, but that doesn't get people to come back for more. And here we can think of a lot of memes and jokes and things where maybe some meme takes off, loads of people start making variations of that meme. And overall, that can get a lot of reach, but the individual person that sees that meme might chuckle about it and might share it with their friends, but they probably don't care about who made it. They're not going to go, oh, who made this? This is great, right? This aligns with my worldview. I want more of this and go find out who the author of the meme is. It is something that's extremely short lived. So retention is that factor that makes the difference between just kind of spreading a message wide and getting no results. That's basically only vanity metrics versus actually building an audience with the work we do. And for that, we need to give people something to identify with and a reason to come back for more. So how do we do that? How do we create content that gets a lot of reach, that is shareable, but also gets people to actually want to engage with us, gets people to remember us and our brand? The formula to follow here is that we need to create content that is unique. So it's not just a copy pasted meme or something like that. Content that aligns with someone's worldview or their values, plus content that induces FOMO of some sort. We have to have that fear of missing out element. And that's the new puzzle piece. Because again, as you can see, we're stacking here. If we have followed the first two steps, we already have content that aligns with people's values and with their demand and their worldviews. So the thing we need to add is that FOMO factor. And there are two ways to tap into this. There are two ways to create this. The first one is the entertainment or news factor. And the second one is about learning and becoming. So the entertainment or news factor, you can think of this as like the Starbucks factor. Whenever you walk into a Starbucks, you always get the same experience. It's that a consistent experience and it's consistent positive experience. So if you go to Starbucks and you like what you get, then you might form a habit of going to Starbucks because you can reliably get that same experience. And that is something that drives behavior. So this can be true, for example, for a news site. Maybe I read a news site and I feel like I'm up to date. I know what's going on and that's a satisfying feeling. And then I want to keep doing that every day. I want to update again and get that feeling again of, OK, I know what's going on. But it could also be that I read a news site and I'm outraged. I get the feeling that, oh, my God, the world is terrible. Everything is falling apart. But also that feeling, I can get addicted to that feeling. And so I keep coming back because I keep wanting that response. And again, the factor here is the consistency. I have to be able to rely. I know that every time I go to this new site, I'm going to be angry at, you know, the other group that I'm that I like to be angry about. And so if a brand or a website offers that kind of consistent experience, that is one thing that gets people coming back for more. The other factor is the learning or becoming factor, which is if I create a piece of content that fulfills all the other criteria that we've talked about, but it's also one piece of a longer journey. And there's a promise of I can go along this journey and it will help me along this journey if I consume more of this content. That is another thing that will get people coming back. So again, if we take the procrastinating entrepreneurs example, we can say, OK, you want to be a highly productive, highly effective entrepreneur. Obviously, that's not going to happen in the span of one article or one video. So there is a longer journey here that you see yourself on where you say, OK, I'm here now. And I have this vision of at some point in the future, I want to be this highly productive, highly successful entrepreneur. Well, if I can make content that helps you on that one step on that journey, but also implies there's more here, right? If you subscribe, if you come back, if you get on my newsletter, I will keep delivering stuff that helps you on subsequent steps on this journey. That again, keeps people coming back. Or if we think of it from the FOMO angle, you fear that you're missing out on the other valuable steps along the journey if you don't come back for more. So those are the three human psychology based factors that actually move the needle and actually make an online business or online brand grow. Now, I know that this is a lot to take in. So we've created a PDF worksheet that summarizes all this, that shows you the formulas and that you can use to kind of check your own content against this. And if you've already been creating content and if you've already started with this work, you can also use this to check the results you got in the past. And you'll find that if you have a piece of content that got far better results than any others, you'll probably find that it was better at fulfilling these three factors than your usual content that doesn't get as much of a result. 
So if you want to get that PDF worksheet and you want to get notified for when we release the next part of this audience building series, make sure you sign up below.